Hi, this is Pastor Jill Henning, and I am the Assistant to the Bishop for Leadership and Administration, and we are holding a, um, a slideshow tonight to help you to better understand um, the COVID-19 crisis, and we are excited to have Dr. Erica Bornshed, said, who is um, a pediatrician, an epidemiologist, uh, a researcher, and she is um, also a, a Lutheran, and she's agreed to help us to better understand what this health crisis is all about um, and to give you some knowledge about what's going on in our, in our country. So, uh, Dr. Bornstead, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jill. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Erica Bjornstad. I, As Jill mentioned, I am a pediatrician and an epidemiologist but I'm also a mother and a Christian at an ELCA church in Birmingham, Alabama. I've also worked in Africa as a healthcare researcher on and off for the past 10 years. My goal with this talk is to help synthesize the large amount of information that is out there surrounding COVID-19. I will not have all of the answers to your questions. Some questions don't have answers yet, but I hope to provide you with some answers and most importantly, share why doctors and scientists are getting worked up about this virus and why we need to take action now. I do not want to sound alarmist, but I hope to provide you with the data we do have so you understand that this is not a drill and not an overreaction. We are at the cusp of a tsunami. You remember the pictures of the wave pulling out to the ocean before it struck land. We are at the crux when the wave is pulling back. We run a very real risk of having hospital systems crumble from a tsunami of patients and healthcare workers disappearing. This is occurring in Italy now. We are on the brink of that here in the US, unless we take action now and slow things down. I want to first and foremost make this clear that these are my opinions from what I have interpreted from the data that is out there. None of the institutions I am affiliated with are endorsing this talk. I am grateful for the ELCA Southeast Synod to invite me to share this with you all. Things are changing daily and even hour by hour, so it's possible these slides will be outdated by the time you are watching this. I am not an infectious disease specialist. I am a kidney doctor for children. I did try to pull the data though from reliable and reputable sources as much as possible, CDC, the WHO, or confirm as best as possible the article sources that though I did not have sufficient time to vet at all, and some opinion articles actually did a very good job of synthesizing the data as well, so I will cite those. The data I'll present is as up-to-date as possible for the afternoon of March 16th. These are the questions I will go through. So COVID-19 is a specific name given to a novel or new coronavirus. So these viruses have been around for a long time and typically just cause the common cold. Yet this one is very new, meaning it has never been seen before. Therefore, no one has immunity to it. No one has any resistance. The new virus originated in China in December 2019, and in less than three months, it has spread worldwide. It is now declared a pandemic by the WHO, and a national emergency was declared in the United States on March 13th. This is a worldwide pandemic, yet we are still in the possible window of controlling it and slowing down its impact on our healthcare system and our society. As of March 16th, 2020, the U.S. now has almost 3,500 cases occurring in all states and Washington, D.C. This is more than double since Friday, only three days ago. This is a map to show the relative numbers by state. Darker colors are indicating more cases that have been detected. All states are now affected. Let's take a look at this graph that compares the number of confirmed cases since a country reached 100 cases. So this means once we noticed cases, what did we do to slow things down? The US, once we reached 100 cases, how many days since then? This is our, our rate of rise of cases and you can see it is rising exponentially without signs of slowing down. We are tracking along just as Italy did, sorry, just as Italy is doing as well as Iran. While extreme restrictive measures in Japan and Singapore are showing a different outlook. And once they reached 100 cases, their rate of rise is much slower. We are likely just scratching the surface so far of who is infected in the US. 
there has been a very slow distribution of testing and therefore appropriate rationing of who gets tested in the United States. In Alabama, once tests were available at the state health department, within the first week only a handful of tests were conducted due to strict criteria. There are some reports that we were seeing a rise in reported cases of fever and cough in people that were just not sick enough or meeting criteria for testing. Alabama has since changed their testing procedures and there are starting to be pop-up drive-through testing centers throughout the state and as are occurring in other states. So why all this talk of epidemiology? Epidemiology is the study of disease distribution in a population. It is what gives you all of those previous graphs and draws conclusions from patterns. The last pandemics you may have heard about include the big one in 1918 of the influenza or the Spanish flu that killed more than 50 million people and infected a third of the world's population. Then there's the more recent H1N1 that broke out in 2009. We need to learn from these experiences and not forget what happened. What happened in the 1918 flu? Well, this is an example of one city, Philadelphia, that did not impose social distancing. Even though a few cases had been detected before a large celebratory parade from World War I, the city continued with the parade. Philadelphia's death rate is this solid line after that parade. Within the week of the parade, there were 4,500 people dead in the city. However, St. Louis had a similar situation where a few cases were noted of flu, yet they canceled their parade and they imposed strict social distancing measures and limited social gatherings to less than 20 people. The dotted line is the death rate in St. Louis after the parade. The solid line is Philadelphia. The social distancing does not stop the infections or deaths from happening, but it drastically slows it down. The peak occurs later, and overall there were much fewer deaths. This matters because this gives hospitals time to prepare, to restock on protective equipment, to allow people to recover and open up hospital beds and equipment that is becoming scarce. How does COVID-19 compare to H1N1? It is primarily due to the hospitalization rates. The H1N1 outbreak was quite mild in comparison. There was a lot of panic at times with the H1N1, but less than 1% required hospitalization, and the mortality rate was much lower. We are seeing consistently that both hospitalization rates and mortality are much higher with COVID-19. Hospitalization rates range from 10 to 30%, and mortality, even the lower numbers, are 0.8 to 3% on average. Yet if you look at the Johns Hopkins map tracker by country, some countries are reporting mortality rates as high as 4 to 7%. Regardless of what the actual mortality rate is, it is much higher than H1N1, and it's likely worse than the flu. And regardless, it is definitely much higher hospitalization rates than both H1N1 and the flu. So we need to learn not only from the past, but also quickly from what is occurring with this virus right now in other parts of the world. And thank thankfully, we have the internet and technology to do so. We may soon have to face gut-wrenching decisions in the US that my colleagues in Africa face on a regular basis. Who lives and who dies because you don't have enough equipment? This is occurring in Italy right now. There was a document that leaked from anesthesiologists in Italy that gave doctors guidance on what to do when they are out of beds. In the document, it states that an age limit may need to be placed on who got into an ICU. How long someone is expected to live may need to be considered tough decisions will have to be made. Why is it that tough decisions may be needed? The hospitalization rates with the COVID-19 are very high. In Italy, three of every 10 people infected or 30% are hospitalized. One in 10 people infected need the ICU. These are averages. The numbers are higher for the elderly. In China, one and a half of every 10 people infected is hospitalized, and 0.5 of 10 are requiring intensive care. Some Asian countries like Japan seem to be slowing down the virus, yet they may be much better equipped than we are to handle the wave of patients. 
In the US, it is estimated we have about three beds for every 1,000 people. China has 4.3 beds for every 1,000. Yet Japan has more than 12 hospital beds for every 1,000 people. Experts suggest the cases may double every four to seven days. In the US, we are seeing this on a faster time frame. Cases are doubling in less than four days. According to the CDC data, on March 8th, the US had 500 confirmed cases. And by March 12th, four days later, there were 1,200. Now from Friday, March 13th, when there were 1,600 cases, to today, March 16th, in three days, we have more than doubled the cases in the US to 3,500. In simple terms, how we handle this depends on how fast our cases rise with how much space we have in hospitals. This does not account for healthcare workers getting sick, other equipment that has limitations as well, and how long people stay in the hospital beds. There will be many factors at play, but I wanna walk you through some scenarios that have been discussed and why we are worried what this could do to our healthcare system. We're gonna just simply look at the number of hospital beds, but there are a lot of factors at play. If we do not slow down the rate of infection and conservatively cases only doubled every seven days, based on today's numbers, we could have greater than 200,000 cases by the end of April and more than a three and a half million cases by the end of May. At that time, if all ICU beds only went to those infected with COVID-19, we may have no more ICU beds left. If the infection rates are faster every four days, then by Easter, we may see greater than 400,000 cases in the United States. And by the end of April, greater than 7 million cases. And no more ICU beds by the end of April. By the end of May, we could see a devastation as half of us may be infected and our health care system would be overrun. Other than allergies that shouldn't have a fever, the symptoms between COVID-19 and influenza are basically the same. There have been some reports of kids presenting with diarrhea and vomiting prior to respiratory symptoms, but it is not clear if this is consistent. Some guidelines still suggest a travel history and contact is important, but this part here is purely my opinion. If you have a fever and cough, and you can find a place to get tested for COVID-19, you should get tested. And I repeat, that is if you have a fever and cough. If you cannot get tested, you should assume you have the virus and you should isolate yourself until you are completely without symptoms. So what can one do to help slow down the spread? These are primarily from the CDC and seen in quite a lot of other places as well. So I'm going to highlight some key points that are not always emphasized. Call your doctor before going in. Be sure they're prepared to handle a potential case of COVID-19. Do not go to the emergency room unless it is a true emergency and you would have gone before the outbreak. Self-isolate if you are in a high-risk group, those greater than 60 and those with chronic medical conditions. If you have not already, stock up on supplies for at least a month or more. Food, over-the-counter medications, prescription medications, and don't travel anywhere right now. If you absolutely have to, try to find ways to drive. And what should we do as a community of Christ? Well, we can also learn from the past. Martin Luther encouraged that one should use reason, and during the plague in Germany that killed 40% of its population, he argued you should avoid people in places wherever your presence was not absolutely necessary. A Methodist preacher in Birmingham during the 1918 flu pandemic stated that we should trust science rather than seeking to tempt God to perform a miracle in the preservation of our health. I would strongly urge all congregations to figure out how to e-worship. If you cannot, the Southeast Synod is providing alternatives and others may also be doing the same. Cancel gatherings of more than 20 people or even smaller if possible. Consider Zoom or other electronic means for worshiping. Consider setting up remote devotional or prayer groups. If gatherings must occur, ensure there is frequent hand washing. 
make sure you stay in touch with the vulnerable and isolated members of your congregations. Develop disaster phone trees to touch base with all members regularly. Ensure your links are clear and members are educated about not opening other links from unknown sources. There's also been a sharp rise now in cyber attacks as well. Reach out to local schools, shelters, and other groups that may be closing. They may need stocked up on supplies or need volunteers to ensure vulnerable populations are reached. Food shortages will occur for our most vulnerable populations. This is a graph of why if we act now and slow down the spread, we can prevent that tsunami wave from crashing. We can give our healthcare systems time and hospitals time to prepare and handle the large volume of patients that are coming. We do not yet know when this will end. If we do not see a slowdown from drastic isolation measures or from summer months, this is likely to go on for months. Start planning now on what to do if you cannot worship for prolonged periods of time, even months. Consider forming small groups that stay connected regularly. And take care of yourselves. This may very well be a marathon and not a sprint. Start setting a schedule. Limit your daily exposure to the news stream. Keep exercising. Walking in your neighborhood is still considered social distancing. Stay connected with friends and family during this time. There's some good CDC resources, including a coloring activity book on how to talk through this with children. Just as you are struggling, there are likely those much less fortunate struggling even more just to survive. A lot of families rely on schools to provide meals. Some shelters are closing. It is possible blood banks may run out of blood. Think creatively with your outreach groups on how to reach out to local organizations and support them. Get creative. We can slow down the spread of COVID-19. We need to act now though. Even if it's not in your county or not affected someone you know, it will. Act now as if it has, and we might be able to slow this down enough. And how lucky are we to be in a time with all this technology? Think creatively about worshiping together. In Luther's time and in the 1918 flu, they just canceled worship. There was no e-worship option. Stay safe. Stay connected and keep your distance. Peace be with you all. Dr. Bjorn said, I appreciate your time tonight and especially for your knowledge and your willingness to share this with um, folks across the Southeastern Synod and across um, our church. Um, if we could let us close this time with prayer. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, for our world during these difficult times. We pray that your spirit will guide our leaders, our healthcare workers, and all that respond to this health crisis. We pray for our churches, and we ask that you guide us to be the body of Christ in the midst of this crisis. May we sense your presence that connects us as we physically distance ourselves. Help us to have faith in you throughout these times. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. I do invite you to go to the Southeastern Synod's website, www.elca-ses.org, for a list of online worship resources, um, for online sermons, and for ways in which you can continue to support your neighbors um, during this difficult time. We pray for you and for our communities. May we be God's hands doing God's work, even when we can't be together. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.